feisty mood. And y'all think that I mean to you. <laughs> Roger, did you record yet? Okay, I gotta be nice. <laughs> so good to have Micah and Morgan Warburton here. Don't, I, I may have known Morgan longer, but I, I want it known and on recording like I told Micah. She's here because of him. I invited him here. And he just had to bring her. Oh, I don't have the time to go over. I do have a, a thought I wanted to share to teach on. We'll take a break from the principles of building happy homes. I wanted to teach a different lesson that I, I feel our church needs to be reminded of. And it's timely that I don't have to preach after it. Someone else does. If you will open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. There we go. I was running behind and get things situated. I apologize for that little delay there. Ephesians, chapter 4. If you would still stand with me for the reading of the word. And he gave some apostles. There are still apostles among us today. Although I don't trust the ones that call themselves apostles. <laughs> Side note. Some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. For the perfecting of the saints, and for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of man, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking in truth and love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. I want to talk to you today the process of believing. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity. Thank you for being with us, Lord. Thank you for those that are here, what's going to happen. We're excited. I'm believing more people will come through the door, Jesus. But, Lord, regardless of anything else, it has to be your word, Jesus. Minister and bless it, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I didn't realize. Oh, it was up there. Okay. That I went that whole time without a microphone. I'm sure you're all loud enough, but I'm sure my... My dad will later tell me that he couldn't hear me. All right, so hopefully that's better for those that are listening to the recording. The process of believing is very important. <laughs> and I'm not just talking about church, but we do need to believe. All of salvation hangs on it. I am not, some Pentecostals are afraid to go to this scripture, but I am not. I love going to Acts 16.31. Peter, not Peter, but Paul is talking to the jailer here, and, he, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And that's all he said. The reason why some people are afraid of that, because it doesn't say anything about baptism, it doesn't say anything about Holy Ghost, and, and, and they're afraid of that because it, it exempts it. Thank you. It does not exempt it. You have to take into context of the story, the earthquake had just happened. They just destroyed the prison. The, the prison. the jailer was about to commit suicide, and he's trying to spare his life. And he only had a few moments to get his attention. So he summed up everything. He summed up all that he had to offer in past and in future with one sentence. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that we do hinges on whether or not we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I want to talk about that belief part. Now, I, I'm not going to try and go into a psychology class. That's where Morgan's dad would excel and blow our brains, okay? But I'm not going to try to go too deep, but I do want to go to a little basic level. I did some studying on the process of believing and how it starts. And I learned that our brains have a built-in need to understand. And that makes sense. That's pretty evident when you think about it. From birth to death, we, have, we, we seem to have this built-in need to figure something out and to understand. As you get older, you may care a little less. I don't care. And, but from the caveman, ugh, they want to figure it out. They want to try to have an understanding. And what our brain does, it tries to figure these things out. So what it does is it uses shortcuts as explanations. It uses conclusions and patterns and it figures these things out and it assigns it a belief. Our kid, when it touches a stove, it learns real quick and believes that that stove is hot. And that belief is now a shortcut for hot stove. The old, uh, you know, don't, don't put a, a key in the light socket or a pin in the light socket. My mom put me, let me do it once. And I never had to do it again. My brain did a shortcut. It figured it out. I don't need to do that no more. And it, so that, that may be an intelligent way, but sometimes we make a little bit of wrong conclusions. If B happens to follow too closely to A and, and C is the result, then we tend to blame A for that result. We just we tend to jump to that conclusion. Whether it's right or not, we don't know, but we assign that to a belief. And now we form these beliefs through our conclusions. We form them through our deductions and through our teachings, and we have our whole life built on our beliefs. Going back to that need of understanding, that's why we lean so heavily on our physical senses. Because it's the first thing our brain uses, and it's the easiest. Seeing is believing at first. It takes a, a level of maturity to believe without seeing. You ever had to deal with somebody who's, who hallucinates? It's strong. It's not there. But their physical senses see it. They may even can feel it. But it's not there. They believe it though. But their physical senses tells them it's there. So they believe it. Now, I'm not going to go there. Maybe he will. I don't know what he's preaching. He didn't know what I was teaching. But I wonder how many spiritual hallucinations we have that we're dealing with in the church today. We see and hear things that are not there. We just got through the bait of Satan. I wonder how many offenses are not there, but we, have, we don't come to church because we're offended. Amen. But I'm not going there today. We, we did that already. I just want to deal with hallucinations because it deals with our physical senses and how it controls our belief system. So now we're going through all of our life. Whether it's through experience or through our teachings, we have our beliefs. They, now I want to turn that a little bit and talk about the difficulty of changing those beliefs. Those beliefs become the definition of who we are. We cling to them as if they are our own identity. As something as minute as a sports fan. Because it, it's who we are. I know a, a good friend of mine, good friend of mine that will not allow the color red in his house because he is an Auburn Tiger fan. And that red is just a little too close to that crimson red of Alabama. And it is not allowed in his house. That's who he is. That defines him. And then there's something on the more spiritual side of uh, uh, our spiritual beliefs, it, it defines who we are. I know a really good friend of mine, he pastors another denomination that believes something completely different. And I have not had a, a turns of life or separated us, and I haven't had a conversation with him in a while, but he was struggling with what to believe because as a full-time pastor of one certain belief, he was not free to believe something else. See, what happened was, we had went to a debate between a UP 
DC guy and his guy. We rolled together. Now that's friendship, because somebody's going to come back awkward. And the, the first night was about baptism, and the next night was about the woman. And he was shook. And he summed it up by saying it doesn't matter. And I said, oh, but it does. It does matter. You have to know who you're serving. And I can feel his struggle. If he started to lean one way, he's not a young man. He's been doing, he's been pastoring solo, full time for 30 years. And that was after having a career, one thing. I could, he didn't come out and say it, but I can feel it. What is he going to do if he loses his job over his beliefs? It's hard sometimes to change our beliefs. We've invested so much into our personal belief system. This story reminded me of John the Baptist. Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees. He says, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And yea, when ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that you might believe him. You know why they couldn't believe him? Because it violated who they were. They had been preaching one thing for so long because they were wrong. They couldn't just come back and say, well, we were wrong. Because they would have lost all integrity. They, so they chose to rather go down wrong than to swallow their pride and be made whole. I hope I'm challenging your belief system today. We'll get to that in a minute. There's a, there's a word called homeostasis. It's the tendency toward a relatively stable equilibrium between in, interdependent elements. Basically, we got to keep things level. And our minds like this. Our bodies like it. That's why we got to have a level blood pressure. We like to have level blood sugar. We don't like things elevated, and we don't like things on the low end. No hyper, no hypo. We like it just, uh. And our minds are the same way. So when these challenging thoughts come in and they rock the boat, it ruins the homeostasis. And what do we do? By nature, by natural design. I'm not rebuking anyone here. I'm not saying we all do this spiritually. But by our instinct is to immediately double down on our current belief for the sake of stability. We'll either ignore the challenging fact or we'll explain it away, doubling down on what we already believe so we don't have to risk shaking. And I wonder how many times we do that during the preaching. Oh, if I accept what he's saying today, that's going to change my lifestyle. I'm just teaching today. I'm not preaching. I'm just teaching the process of belief. See, what I'm really trying to do is set you up for the preaching here in a little bit. Let's go a little further. I felt led to teach this lesson today because I really do wonder how much we're really believing what's being preached. And I hate that I'm preaching through the choir at the moment. It never fails. Hopefully, more and more people are watching. Because... See, I've given you scripture that you must repent. But yet, and you say, oh, Brene, we can't come to an altar. No, but the, the pews are still dry. Yeah. A wet altar is a sign of weeping tears. So if your pew is your altar, why is it dry? Yeah. I'm just being honest today. How sincere is your repentance? I've given you scripture that you must be baptized in Jesus' name. And I know not everyone in our congregation has been baptized in Jesus' name. So I've given you a scripture for the last year, time and time and time again. So at some point, you've had a conflict with this process of belief. Which one is it conflicting with? Is it conflicting with your identity? Do you have, is who you are built in being baptized in the title or not being baptized at all? Dare I call you Pharisee? 
I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm trying to actually challenge your unbelief. Why are you not believing what's being preached? Why are you not accepting? I've given you a scripture that you must be filled with the Holy Ghost. I've told you that the Holy Ghost won't come unless you've repented. I told you that Jesus can change your life. I've shown you that you have to actually live for him. Now what are we actually believing? Oh, I feel people getting nervous. I'm not airing dirty laundry. These are my family. This is my family. Like and Morgan, like and Morgan are not strangers. They may be strangers to you, but they're family. I can fight in them and vice versa. For 30 minutes, we was there at our prayer meeting outside the Ace family. We had two people. And then when those two people left, we had two people come in behind them. But the two that came in late were coming in late for work. So four people felt that coming to the house of God for a prayer meeting was the priority of their life. I ask you again, what conflicts are you dealing with? Because they're not going to magically go away. This is a mindset that I'm bluntly dealing with today. Not to hurt feelings, but for the sake of progress. I'm not going to hide and dance around the subject. We have to take the bull by the horns and say, this is what I'm dealing with. I don't like it because that's not what my mama and my daddy taught. That's a real issue people face. I'll tell you right now, the Bible says unless you've been born again of water and spirit, you won't even see the kingdom of heaven. So if your grandma was not baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, what does that mean? It means God's a just God. But the Bible says she won't see the kingdom of heaven. That hurts people's feelings. And we don't want to accept that. So we would rather be wrong. Than to believe. Well, that's a big issue. We need to take the word Christian off our chest. Jesus once told someone who was praying for his son, Jesus said to him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Now that I can relate to. I know what it's like to have a weak moment. I know what it's like to know, but your faith not match what you know. And that's what church is for. Man, that is what we're here for. Amen. I'm not rebuking you. If anything, I'm encouraging you. Amen. Telling you there's still a God that can lift you back up to where your faith should be. Yes, hallelujah. Amen. Who is struggling with unbelief today? Let's do a self-check. Here's the thing about believing. Is you don't, believing does not require truth. Sometimes we can believe a lie. And sometimes we can lie to ourselves so strongly and thoroughly that we are victims of self-deception. I was teasing Miranda. Y'all know I tease her. I accuse her of not loving me. She does. I know she does. I just tease her. It's fun. But here's the thing. I can hook her up to a lie detector test and ask her if she loves me, and she'll pass because she believes she loves me. That doesn't mean she does. <laughs> that just means she believes she does. <laughs> what do you really believe today? What is so grounded in your heart that you could pass that lie detector test? you really believe that your life has to change? Do you really believe that you have to live every day for God and not just a couple of days of the week? Do you really believe that you have to speak like a Christian? Hang out and watch 
things like a Christian, behave like a Christian, all those things affect the product that we're giving to God. Some of us are convinced that we love Jesus. We can pass that lie detector test. Yet Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So here's what's going to happen the rest of the service. My Sunday school lesson was 30 minutes shorter than what Miranda was expecting. So I'm going to go send someone here in a minute and let them know that Sunday school is over. And she's going to be aggravated. She's going to feel disrespected because I didn't give her time to finish her lesson. Rightfully so. And she may come in here with a little chip on her shoulder that y'all won't feel, but I'll feel it because I'm her husband. <laughs> and she's going to sing a song. And here's the Here's where the service starts. You have a choice to either believe the words or not believe the words. The words will be up here, hopefully. And you, you don't have to know the song. But if it says, what we sing, I'm going to praise the Lord. I believe that. Let your belief drive you. Let your mind decide I'm going to believe it. And your belief will drive your worship. And then we're going to pray. And all oh men, when the, when the saints of God would believe when they pray, we're going to lift up the folks that are sick. We're going to lift up the folks that are hurting. We're going to lift up the children that need to be in church and they're not in church. And we're going to believe. Yes, amen. Amen. Or are we? We're just going to go through the motions. And then we'll sing, maybe sing again. Eventually the preacher will come up here and he's going to deliver what the Lord will lay on his heart. And it may conflict with what you have come here with today. It may not sit well with your life. It may require some repentance. It may require some conviction. And it is up to you to decide whether or not you're going to live for God or not. But as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. I promise you, we will never be anything more than just a gaggle of folks making noises if we don't believe that this Bible is real. But if we would start to believe just a little bit, it'll grow into a lot. And then we can change the world. But that choice is yours. I cannot make you. I wish I could. Oh boy. If I could choke you. <laughs> if I could drag you to the water and hold you under till you bubbled. <laughs> praise God we'd have revival. But instead I must stand here and plead and try to speak logic to you. And hope that my that you don't mistake my passion for meanness. That you understand that it's just a burden. And that you receive it. And that we can all grow and be better. Amen? Amen. Brandon, if you would, cease it. Taylor, if you would go collect. That way you can get the, the guardian out of this. Any questions or comments?